All right. Well, folks are logging in tonight. I'm just going to go ahead and start with introductions. So hi, folks. Uh, my name is Olivia Maya Ortiz, and I'm an educator here at the School for Advanced Research's Indian Arts Research Center. If you're logging in right now, then you're joining us for another installation of our SAR Artist Live series. Um, this program is partially funded by the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department and the 1% Lodgers Tax. Um, so this season of SAR Artists Live, we are further exploring the exhibition Grounded in Clay, The Spirit of Pueblo Pottery. If you're unfamiliar with it, um, the exhibition is curated by the Native communities it represents, and it works to give voice and authority to the Pueblo Pottery Collective, which is a group of over 60 individual members of 21 tribal communities who selected and wrote about pieces from two significant Pueblo Pottery Collections, um, the Indian Arts Research Center here at the School for Advanced Research, and also the Vilcek Foundation of New York. So with us tonight is Dr. Joseph Aguilar, also known as Woody, um, and he's an, an enrolled member of the San Ildefonso Pueblo and currently serves as an archaeologist with the Bering Straits Native Corporation and also as the Pueblo's Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Uh, Dr. Aguilar has received his PhD from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and his research interests include, but are not limited to, indigenous archaeology, museums, landscape archaeology, and tribal historic preservation. Welcome, Woody, and thanks for joining us. And would you like to welcome us in your, or introduce yourselves to us in your own words? Uh, sure. Um, I don't have much to add to that introduction. Thank you. Um, thanks for putting this all together. You're I'll welcome. have to admit I'm not an Instagram person. Um, <laughs> You will be after tonight. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I grew up in the, the MySpace, Facebook era, but nonetheless, still pretty cool to be to be on this platform. Um, and yeah, just going to chat. And like uh, Olivia said, it's going to be pretty informal. Um, I'm open to whatever happens in the next, uh, what, hour or so? Uh, 30 minutes. Or 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Cool. No pressure. It's just 30 yeah. minutes. Maybe All right. Less. 30 minutes is cool. All right. So we definitely need at least one question from the audience for our internet elder here, who's our guest. Um, <laughs> uh, do you want to introduce your friend in the background? Oh, um, doesn't have a name, but he's just oh. kind of overseeing the conversation tonight. Okay. Uh, in the Christmas spirit, too. Yeah, I have our, our, our chilies up. <laughs> also in the spirit. <laughs> well, I guess just to get things started, um, for folks who may be unfamiliar, do you, can you just tell us a little bit about your entry into archaeology or anthropology? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've been doing archaeology for a long time now, like 20 years, um, which explains, might help explain why I'm not really too much into Instagram. Um, but yeah, I, I started off doing archaeology um, at Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, for their archaeology program. At the time, I was a, a student at UNM, undergraduate student, trying to find my way through a degree. I um, found out um, anthropology and archaeology could uh, kind of offer me a path to kind of understanding um, our history as Pueblo people, but more importantly, um, it, it kind of led me down the path of protecting and preserving, um, you know, our, our histories and our current culture, cultural resources, however they might be defined. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the my, my origins, I guess, in, in anthropology. Um, and it's led me to do lots of different things, including graduate school, um, all the cool stuff I get to do with museums and SAR, for example, with this cool exhibit. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, a long, windy path that I've taken to get where I am. How did you transition from archaeology into the museum consultation and exhibition development work that you do? Um, well, museums, museum collections, and archaeology, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, museums are the repository for many archaeological collections and ethnographic collections. So I, I understood 
kind of the origins of where uh, collections came from. You know, I understood that background. Uh, you know, the field projects that resulted in these massive collections that we have um, in New Mexico and across the country. So I wanted to kind of provide more context into both uh, disciplines, the museum side of things and the archaeology side of things, um, because they often kind of missed each other. You know, the, the two disciplines, they, um, they didn't often intersect historically. So uh, it's good to see more intersection in, in the fields. Um, so that's, that's kind of, it was, it was a natural fit for me. Yeah. Um, can you maybe give a few examples of how your current practice might differ from historical practices in terms of archaeology and anthropology? Uh, sure. Like, so the way I, I well, I'll, I'll start off by saying that I'm, I know it's a big question, <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I'll start off by saying that I'm really critical or have, have been critical of the disciplines of anthropology and archaeology just because of the, the legacies that they have within our communities, um, not just public communities, but um, Native communities across the country. Um, just terrible legacies, bad practices, um, a lot of ethically shady kind of practices, you might say. Um, and so I, I, as I gained an interest in the field, I didn't want to practice archaeology as it's been done in the past. So, and so now I, I follow um, the the tenets of what has become uh, known as indigenous archaeology. So it's a way that kind of subverts the traditional practices of archaeology. Um, inserts a lot of indigenous uh, native thought sensibilities practices into the way that archaeology is practiced so that it's um, beneficial to our communities and to us as native people. Um, so that's the approach I take in archaeology. Um, and you'll, you'll find, especially here in the Southwest, that it's, it's become harder and harder to practice archaeology without engaging with um, public communities here. Um, so it, the discipline has definitely come a long way, but there's still lots to be gained, I think, in archaeology. Yeah. Well, transitioning now to the Grounded in Clay exhibition, um, you have an essay which is titled Asserting Indigenous Intellect into the Collection. And that's um, for folks who haven't accessed the catalog yet. You can purchase it or you can also see it online at groundsedinclay.org. Just got to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Woody. <laughs> Good salesperson. Um, but anyhow, you have an essay that's featured in this catalog. And in one part, you discuss that pottery is burdened with the, ex with the expectations of doing so much throughout its life and, and beyond, you know, its uh, intended uses, perhaps. Can you expand upon that a little bit more for us? Yeah, I think that was one of my entries um, for the catalog. Um, for one of the specific pieces. I, I talk about pottery as having this burden of, of, of telling history or being history. Um, because when it comes to archeology span or the archeological record, you know, the, the things that are left behind that we see on the ground or in the ground, um, pottery, as a ceramic, as fired clay, it's, it's one of the more resilient um, uh, pieces of material culture, public material culture. Um, so it remains long after more perishable items um, have, have kind of um, been lost to time, such as uh, organic materials. Oh, there you go. You were, yeah, you wrote about that piece. Yeah, that's a table of polychrome from the mm -hmm. North area what page is that um by the way um mine says page 14. okay yeah so so it it, it remains in the archaeological record long after many other traces of pueblo material culture um are gone 
So archaeologists, or the practice of archaeology has made a lot of assumptions based on pottery um, because it's the most abundant thing in the archaeological record. It stays, it's, it, uh, it's resilient, you know, it's fired earth, so it breaks, it shatters, but it doesn't pulverize, it doesn't um, decompose. And so it's, it's left... So that's what we have left, especially archaeologists, you know, they, they, they pick up these, um, they do studies on pottery, they classify it, um, they make a lot of interpretations about who we are as public people, um, based not completely on pottery, but pottery is probably one of the biggest parts of that. Um, and so I wrote in my essay that um, that's a big burden for pottery to hold. Um, because there's so much more to public culture than just pottery. Although pottery, it's beautiful, it's, um, it's utilitarian, it serves a lot of purposes, um, but it's not the only thing that can tell a history or a story about public people. So that's kind of where I, I came up, I, my train of thought is with that idea. Also going to just say some of the comments say that catalog is beautiful and it's a beautiful publication. Um, I still don't see a question yet from the audience, so someone has to think of something. But um, kind of on that that note of what you're saying, I think um, in a diff in a separate entry, you talk about how the pottery that is represented in the exhibition it's important for the retention and transmission of certain aspects of public culture, history, and identity. Um, when we're talking about retaining and transmitting those aspects of culture, how how do you think that retention and transmission is achieved if, if that question makes sense and yeah that's a that's also a big question um <laughs> oh what... wait i'll let you percolate on it because someone just asked a question is that oh. indian tea you're drinking uh no it's not it's just um chinese black tea <laughs> <laughs> okay i need to well, we, it's still good, and we got a question. So anyway, back to what, what I was asking you about. Um, yeah, so what, one of the, the great things about museums is, you know, they've become repositories um, for these kind of bits of material culture. And when, you know, when, when if used properly, pottery can do a lot of good things for our communities. It can it can help or aid be a tool in the retention and transmission of public culture, but it's, it's not the only thing, you know, it's, um, I, I see museum collections, pottery in particular as a, as a starting point to those bigger goals of retaining and um, trans transmitting uh, our culture. Um, but, you know, museums aren't, aren't going to be the saviors of, of public culture um, or identity. Um, but they, they could be starting points. They could be tools in that endeavor. Um, so that's where I see the usefulness of, of these types of collections and, and pottery in particular. Okay, that definitely helps to clarify the point. Um, I'll go ahead and show folks the other piece that you wrote about, which is a beautiful storage jar. Hopefully folks can see that. And Woody, I think it's on page 15. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, so um, in this this entry, you, you talk about this storage jar and you relate it to um, Pajarito Plateau. Could you just let folks know a little bit more about what you were discussing in that entry and how the storage jar relates to that place? Yeah, so the the pottery is, is known, it's a, it's a type or a style known as um, Bohuage Polychrome. Bohuage is a, the Tewa name for San Aldefonso Pueblo. And of course, um, Bohuage doesn't translate directly to San Aldefonso Pueblo. It has a completely different meaning. Uh, the meaning roughly translated into English um, uh, translates to where the water cuts through. And so what I wrote in my entry is that the, there's, there's problems, right, with um, how anthropologists or curators, archaeologists have classified certain types of Pueblo pottery. You know, they give it um, generic terms based on geography or um, its color. 
like a, a Galisteo black on white, for example, or a Salado polychrome. These are merely descriptions. But in this case, I think the the title or the um, the name for this particular kind of pottery is fitting. Um, and so I talk about like what what what's the name? You know, what does it mean? Um, and in this case, you know, the it's a perfect descriptor for or the name Pohoge is a perfect descriptor for the landscape in which the Pueblo um, kind of exists on the within the topography. So it's right at the mouth of a canyon um, where the water kind of literally cuts through um, a, a deep canyon to the south towards uh, towards Kochti. Um, so I, I wrote a little bit about like how many of um, the names that pottery has been given over the over the years by anthropologists is is a play on place, a play on uh, geography, a play on really basic, simple things like color, um, and for us to consider kind of the deeper meanings of uh, what these names actually mean to us as Pueblo people. Yeah, so there's a lot of power that goes into naming vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, someone asks, what about these particular pieces resonated with you that made you want to write about them? Well, for the get polychrome it's you know it's from San Alfonso so that was easy I was really drawn to that because it's from my own community um, although we don't know who the maker is um, I, I still felt the kind of I felt drawn to the piece um, I, I really can't explain it it's just from my community and I just wanted to explore like what that name uh, means, not not explore, but explain to the public what that name means. Um, and with the table polychrome, um, the topic of my dissertation was the Pueblo Revolt. And this particular um, type of pottery dates directly to that period of the Pueblo Revolt from like 16, late 1680s to the 1690s. Um, and they're pretty rare out there in, um, the archaeological record or, or in museum collections and SAR just happens to have a couple of these in the collection maybe maybe three at the most but um, so I just wanted to, to explore the these pieces more because they're one close to my they're from my community both are from my community um, and they they have a, a bigger history to tell I think that could be explored through, uh, through just kind of looking at them some more and writing about yeah. them yeah well, your entries are really beautiful. And for folks who don't know, um, members of the collective were invited to um, just spend time with pieces and choose whatever call to them. So these are the two pieces that Woody, Woody selected out of both collections. Um, another question, which seems like a lot to unpack, asks um, in, the, in the comments, asks, what other pieces of the archaeological record besides pottery that we can rely on to accurately tell indigenous history? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so what I tried to do in, in my work and in my dis dissertation in particular was not so much rely just on the archaeological record. That's part of history um, and part of the history that I'm, that I'm trying to explore, you know, this, this era of the Pueblo Revolt where, you know, our people uh, went through a lot of suffering, but were also resilient and um, uh, triumphant in many ways. So it's, my approach was to look at, yes, the archaeology, but I wanted to bring in other sources of uh, information, including oral histories. Um, and I really wanted to take a critical look at um, the Spanish uh, ethno-historic records, so these journals um, that many of the narratives that we've come to know and learn or are being taught in schools in Santa Fe, um, they set the standard for the narrative of, of this era. Uh, for example, give me a second. Um, I'm grabbing a book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We can wait patiently. So, for example, like much of what is known about the post-1680 revolt era 
like say 1692, what is to 96 or so, that is known as the uh, Reconquest era, is based on the writings of uh, Don Diego de Vargas. And these journals were translated by the University of New Mexico in the 90s. There's like six volumes. Um, so this guy Vargas wrote a lot. Um, and it's all contained, been translated into English, into journals like this. Um, Borderlands historians have taken these transcriptions and kind of put their own, given their own take or provided their own kind of interpretations of, of these journals. And for better or worse, those Borderlands historians, um, like I said before, they set the narrative that we've come to know and understand. This is where the myths of like the peaceful reconquest and um, things of that nature come into play. It's because these historians took this information, wrote it in a way that they thought um, was sufficient or correct. When in fact, if you look at what's on the ground, on the you know as far as the archaeology is concerned, or if you talk to public people, you look at oral histories. Um, a different story starts to emerge, right? Um, yeah. So what I tried to do was not be dismissive of the ethno-historic record, um, but rather be critical of it and try to weave these different types of data together, archaeology, oral histories, ethno-histories, um, and present a different narrative. Um, yeah. So that, that's kind of my take on on how I do my work. It's not just archaeology; it's kind of history, oral histories. It's lots of different things. The parallel, I'd like to think that the grounded in clay exhibition by the work that the Pueblo Pottery Collective has done is working just in a similar way of incorporating oral histories and creating a more full narrative and description of you know what these pieces are and and what they mean to each community. Um, I'm going to ask you one question I have, and then we'll see if we have time for, for another one in the chat box. Um, there's a certain part of one of your entries where you say, if Native American communities are themselves to benefit from these collections, not in the same manner, but to the same degree, and I think you're um, referencing um, Western models here, um, communities must lead the way toward change concerning the accession, dissemination, and representation of our cultural patrimony. Um, so when I read this, it made me think about uh, tribal cultural centers and just tribal museums. And I was hoping that maybe you could expand upon this quote here, but also maybe give us some insight into your role within um, developing a cultural center at San Ildefonso. Yeah, I, I think what I was trying to get to there was that we just have to become more assertive and insert or assert our sovereignty, assert our intellect, which was the title of my, uh, my essay. Um, like just really emphasize those and, and insert them into these, these spaces, these museum spaces, uh, these academic spaces, these written, if you want to call these spaces, um, because, you know, the, the written, the books, they, they live on. Um, and so we just have to be more assertive and maybe perhaps take a leap into a field or fields that we're unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with. Um, for example, I, you know, I wasn't introduced to archaeology or anthropology museums as a kid, even though it was happening all around me. Um, and I think part of it goes back to that legacy of those disciplines in our communities, how, how, how harmful they've been. Um, but I saw that there's a way to make these things, these disciplines, the, these practices better. Um, but by doing so, what a way to do it is to just assert ourselves into these into these things into these practices um and we have lots of people doing it we are doing it right um lots of other young scholars who have come through sar through their um internship programs or through um you know the the resident uh scholar programs um they're doing it or they're doing it in university settings or through tribal historic preservation offices or through tribal museums um, so there's a, a 
it's a burgeoning field, I guess, or it's a, it's it's flourishing, it's beginning to flourish. But I think there's, if we assert ourselves more, this could be a really awesome thing, I think. Yeah, and that sounds like it relates to another portion you were discussing, what is it? what it means to just add in indigenous voices versus acknowledging the right of indigenous peoples to express their own accounts and understanding of, of cultural patrimony. Someone in the chat box says, um, this will be the last big question for you tonight, Woody. So <laughs> can you take a sip of your tea? <laughs> We're almost there. <laughs> I don't mind. Oh. Um, can you talk about how these pottery pieces that you selected might tell us about the expertise Pueblo's peoples, Pueblo peoples had about their ecosystem, especially the, se the selection of clay used for pottery. Yeah, not being a potter myself, I, 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 don't, I don't have too much to add about like clay and what that means as far as like where it's gathered or, or things of that nature. But what I, what I can say is that these these pieces, they're imbued with lots of different meanings. Um, as a non-pottery maker, or I, I don't paint pottery, um, I don't always know like what all those, what the symbols mean or what the designs mean. But generally, I can say that they're, they're all imbued with like this much deeper meaning than just uh, an aesthetic kind of, of meaning. Sure, I mean, um, I'm sure the creators of these pieces, you know, had that aesthetic kind of quality in mind when they were creating them, but they're, they're much more than just, just beautiful pieces. They're, um, they have different meanings, they have different functions um, within our communities. You know, some are used for just kind of everyday types of things. Others are used for more um, uh, significant purposes. Um, so I think by having each like 60 plus, right, community members, bring that whole breadth and range of knowledge into into the interpretation of this pottery it, it just really showcases or or brings to light the um really the depth of of knowledge that we have about not just pottery but our communities and our histories in general yeah i think it's great also to yeah refer people to the catalog to just learn more and become more familiar there's a lot of really knowledgeable potters who, who speak to how they harvest clay bodies and understand the natural environments around them in order to, to do that, just to get at that question a bit more. Um, we're almost at 30 minutes. So in case there's any last minute questions, we're already gonna be wrapping up pretty soon. Um, for folks who haven't seen the exhibition, if you are local or near to Santa Fe, you can see it at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. It will be on display through May 2023. And if you're a New Mexico resident, please come by this Sunday to the museum. We're going to be doing um, some fun, family-friendly programming. Um, and beyond that, thanks, Woody, for joining us tonight. And it was good to chat with you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Of course. And if anybody has any follow-up questions, I don't know if this is going to be broadcast later or recorded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll post uh, it to YouTube. Okay. They can reach out to me somehow through Instagram <laughs> or wherever. Maybe through Instagram, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to answer more questions. Uh, this was fun. Thank you for... Cool. Well, I can, if you want, we can find a way to link your email or link your Instagram when we post the video on YouTube and just folks in uh, the comments saying thank you and thanks for the info. So yeah, sure. it was fun. Have a good evening and cool. enjoy your holidays. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks.